Greetings, fellow learners. Now, before we get into this wonderful video on distillation in the informal architecture, I have a thought-provoking question for you. Can you give an example of how you strived towards efficiency in your workplace? For me, I'm a machine learning engineer, and as such, I create machine learning models, and sometimes I deploy them as services. And these services would receive a request and return a response. And when there is very high volume of traffic that is entering the service, I try to see if there are ways to write my code itself more efficiently so that the response times would go down and we can service requests faster. Now, turning this question over to you, how do you deal with efficiency in your workplace? Whether you are in tech or not, I would love to hear your comments and thoughts down below. Now, this video is going to be divided into three passes, the what and why of distillation, how distillation, and coding distillation. So let's get to it. This is the transformer neural network. It has an encoder and a decoder. And this was originally designed to solve a sequence to sequence problems. Now, sequence is data with a defined ordering, like words in a sentence or time series data. And originally, it was implemented with language translation in mind. And here, the sequence length is small to moderate, and so this architecture works pretty well. But when the sequences get very long, as we do see in some time series data problems, this architecture has three main issues. The first is the quadratic computation of self-attention. The second is the memory bottleneck in stacking layers for long inputs. And the third is the speed plunge in predicting long outputs. Now in this video, we want to focus on the concept of distillation in the encoder. And so the first two challenges are what's relevant here. And we will talk about each while introducing distillation itself. So the quadratic computation of self-attention. Attention involves how much focus one data point should have on another data point. Larger the focus, greater is their correlation. Self-attention means we compare all the input data points to all the same input data points, and we identify these correlations. For n input time series data points, the traditional full self attention requires some order of n squared multiplication operations, and this can be costly for long input sequences. The informer architecture addresses this using prob sparse self attention, and this involves identifying a subset of active data points and only perform multiplication operations with them. And with this type of attention, we can reduce the number of multiplication operations from the order of n squared to the order of n log n. Less multiplication operations means faster processing during the forward pass, which means faster inference. Now, the second challenge that we talked about was the memory bottleneck in stacking layers for long inputs. So in the transformer architecture, the encoder layers are stacked and each encoder layer requires some order of n squared multiplication operations, where again, n is the length of the time series sequence. Now, more stack layers means much more memory is consumed by the resulting matrices. And to reduce the memory consumed, the informer makes use of distillation. Distillation in chemistry involves extracting some component from a mixture. And in much the same way, the informer extracts a subset of active data points from all the input data points. And so in one encoder layer, we perform the prob sparse attention. And with this, we will have active data points with which we continue performing operations on. And we have lazy data points that remain untouched for the most part. And these lazy data points are just occupying some space. And so we can remove them. And hence, we extract just the active data points, pass this subset of active data points to the next encoder layer. And in this way, when we stack the encoder layers, the informer architecture makes use of far less memory than in the traditional architecture. Quiz time. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. 
Why do we perform distillation? A. To improve the interpretability of the model. B. To reduce the size of the model while maintaining performance. C. To increase the number of parameters in the model. Or D. To increase the computational complexity of the model. Now comment your answer down below and let's have a discussion. And if you think I do deserve it at this point, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. Now that's going to do it for quiz time and pass one of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. Let's now talk about how distillation is performed in an architecture standpoint. So here is the high level architecture for the transformer and the informer. Now, let's take a magnifying glass to see the crux of the attention operation for both of these. So this top diagram over here is the expanded architecture for the transformer attention block, specifically just this case where it says mass multi-head self-attention. And this bottom layer over here is going to be the self-attention operation that's performed in prob sparse attention. And you can see it's a lot more complicated stuff that's going on here. But let's identify one similarity and one difference between these two architectures. Starting with, let's just say the similarity and the commonality. So for both architectures, the transformer and the informer, if we were to pass like the time series vectors into the transformer, its essential operation is just going to encode some attention information into those vectors. Now, the same is true for the prob sparse attention. If we pass in some time series vector data to the input, this entire attention operation is going to be performed and it will encode the attentionness into these time series vectors at the output end. So that's the commonality. Now, let's actually take a look at one difference between these two. So like I mentioned before, for this transformer architecture, this here is the crux of the attention operation. And in this crux, you can see that we are multiplying a query vector and a key vector all together. Now, a query vector and a key vector, they're simply two different representations of the same input time series data. And here, we're, this is going to be of the order of n, that is the total number of data points, and this will also be of the order of n, total number of time series data points. And when you multiply these two together, this operation is going to be an O of n square operation. So it's quadratic in the sequence length. This operation is extremely expensive for very long time series data. And so in order to combat doing this operation, despite how simplistic it looks in the diagram, we expand it to do all of this that you see down here, just to avoid that quadratic multiplication. So in another video, I have actually explained exactly how we go about every operation here, but essentially we are going to just take a subset of the input values and then we perform the multiplication here. So it becomes an O of n log n multiplication instead of O of n squared. And we do that wherever we can, including in this operation where Q bar is just order of log n rows and K is going to be order of n records. And so the multiplication is going to be O of n log n. And so the overall idea here in prob sparse attention is that we are going to perform the multiplication operation and this entire attention operation in order of n log n instead of the order of n squared. So now let's switch over to another diagram over here. And let's now assume for the prob sparse attention, we're just going to pass in a very simple tensor of 1 cross 10 cross 4. So batch size one, there's going to be 10 time series data points and each time series data point is gonna have four of a, a vector size of four. And so we will pass this one cross 10 cross four tensor into this prop sparse attention sequence. It's going to perform all of its wonderful things that it will. 
and then it's going to lead to a 1 cross 10 cross 4 output with the attention vectors encoded. And if you actually peel the layers behind this and you look at the actual data, what you will notice is that it might look something like this, where you have a bunch of queries, which we call active queries, there are six of them here, and then we'll have a bunch of lazy queries, which are going to be the exact same column values. And just to be clear, each of these columns is going to be a time series vector. So this is for timestamp one, this is for timestamp two, this one's for timestamp three, timestamp four, all the way up to timestamp 10. And four of these are going to be lazy queries, whereas six of them are going to be active queries. Now, because there is no really need for these lazy queries, we want to get rid of them. And so we use a process of distillation to separate these lazy queries from the active queries and extract just the active queries. And this is kind of like distillation in chemistry, where we're separating compounds from a mixture. And so in order to do this, what we would do is we would perform a convolution followed by a batch normalization, then an activation, and a pooling. And in doing so, what's going to happen is that this entire 1 cross 10 cross 4 tensor is going to re reduce to a 1 cross 5 cross 4 tensor, where we have removed the lazy queries and transformed the active queries to, to this tensor. And effectively, this entire distillation part is then going to be piped into another encoder layer, encoder layer number two. And so what we can do is concatenate these encoder blocks to ensure faster processing and low time and space complexity. Quiz time. It's that time of video again. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Which of the following operations is responsible for reducing the size of the input tensor in our current informer setup? A the convolution 1D, B, the batch normalization, C, the LO activation, or D, max pooling 1D. Comment your answer down below and let's have a discussion. That's gonna do it for quiz time and pass two of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. Now, for this next pass, we're going to actually code out the distillation process. So we'll start with importing some libraries over here, and then we'll just initialize a vector y, which is going to be the output of the prob sparse attention. So in our case, we're just taking a 1 cross 10 cross 4 tensor that we're using as an example. And specifically, you can kind of see the nature of this tensor is that you have lazy queries, that is, this is timestamp one, timestamp three, timestamp four, and timestamp seven, that are all going to be lazy queries because they are the same values, and the rest are going to be active queries. And the point of this distillation is to isolate just the active queries from this entire set of data, and we perform some transformations on it, and thereby making this tensor much more compact so it enables faster inference and training. And to perform this, we first perform a convolution followed by a batch normalization, followed by an activation, followed by a pooling. So let's take a look at each of them one by one, starting with a one-dimensional convolution. So here's just a GIF that shows kind of high level of how this convolution operation should work, where you can imagine that each of these records is going to be one time step vector. So this would be time step one, time step two, time step three, and so on. And we're going to use this blue thing, which is going to be like a kernel that's going to perform a element wise multiplication and sum in order to get every single value for every single time the kernel slides. And so the effect of one kernel is that it's going to create a single vector here. And if we have multiple kernels, we can create multiple such vectors and concatenate them. With this overall view in the convolution operation, we actually can code it out pretty simply by defining a conv1d, where the number of in channels is dmodel. dmodel I've defined to be four. So four channels input, four channels output, 
kernel size 3, padding 1. What this means is that when there are four input channels, it means that each time step has four vectors. So in this case, this would have this is three vectors per time step, but we would have four technically. Out channels is four. This means that we'll have four kernels like this, these four of these blue three cross three rectangles. We'll have four of them that iterates over the entire data. Kernel size three means that, like you see exactly in the image, we are going to make sure that we have one kernel is going to go across three time steps of data every single time in order to compute the element-wise product. And then padding one means that we want to start, as we see in this diagram, before the first time step and end after the last time step. And overall, I've kind of described the operation exactly as I have mentioned it in words over here. And effectively, the shape is not changed. It's still a one cross 10 cross four tensor. And the vectors now have a sense of local context because of that kernel size. So we added some transformation to the data here. I've also implemented this convolution 1D just so that, you know, for your reference, you can see exactly how conv 1D is working out, um, but I'm not really going to go through it here, but you can see that the transformations indeed do work. So the next operation is batch normalization, where what we want to do is pass in D model, which is again four. And the idea of batch normalization here is just to normalize our data to stabilize the values during training for faster and more stable training and also better performance during uh, the training phase. And so what we would do is initialize batch normalization, and then we can perform the normalization in order to get a transformed tensor of the same shape. Once again, I've implemented batch normalization. And if you want to see exactly how it works, I have also have another video describing batch normalization right over here. Next, let's move on to an activation function, which is ELU. So ELU is going to add nonlinearity to the data so that it can learn more complex patterns. In order to define this activation function, we are going to initialize ELU. And here, it's just going to say the alpha value is one. That is the alpha over here. And let's say that now we have Y over here. If we pass it through an activation, we're going to get this output tensor. And we can actually test to see if this works because for the positive values, you can see that it should be X itself, which is exactly what we see here. Right? If we look at the positive values for ELU, if X is greater than zero, it should be X itself. And yep, we see that over here. And for the negative values, let's say if X is this, negative 0 0.6572, let's write that out here. It should be the same thing, E to the power of X minus one. And alpha is one, so if we do that, we see negative 0. Point, you have four, we see that negative 0 0.49 and we can see the value here. So every single one of these values is now transformed into these values. And I just wrote a custom elu over here in case you were curious about how we can code out the same function. And so elu overall for each element performs a linear or exponential transformation and the shape of the tensor does not change. And like other activation functions, it introduces nonlinearity so the network can learn complex patterns. But unlike ReLU, it prevents dead neurons and vanishing gradients, and so the neurons can learn. Next, we're gonna go through max pooling, the final operation here. So for max pooling, we define a kernel size of three with a stride of two and padding of one. So with this operation, what that means is, let's say that this Y here is now the input that we have, then the output of this tensor after max pooling is going to look like this. So what's gonna happen here is that we know each of these records is going to be one sliver of a time step, and we have like 10 of these time steps. Now, across these time steps, we know the kernel size is three, and when padding is one. So let's say the padding is one, so we're gonna start from before this time step. So that's the first one, the second one, and the third one over here. And what we wanna do is just determine which is going to be the maximum value across all of these three. Now for the first 
time step, you know, just comparing these two, you can see that the maximum between these two over here is 0 0.02. We write it here. Max of these two is 0 0.013 over here. Max of these is 0 0.203 over here. Maximum here is 0 0.5062, hence it's written over here, right? Now for the next stage, we know that the stride here is two, so we have to move the window by two positions down. So this is one position down, and this is two positions down. So you can see, let's say that we're over here for now this new max pulling operation, and we want to compare and get the maximum across all of these columns. So the max of these three values is going to be negative 0 0.2282, hence we write it here. The max of this is 0 0.06, write it here. Max of this is 0 0.0891, hence you write it here. Max of this is 0 0.5062, hence we write it over here. And similarly, we're going to now stride of two, we're gonna do the same here. Stride of two then again, we're gonna do the same here. And then stride of two where we're going to compare these three. And then write these values accordingly. And so overall, I've described the entire process in words over here that I just discussed. And effectively, max pooling is going to slice the time dimension in half. And the max pooling will allow us to only select more active queries and leave out the more redundant lazy queries. And here is now the code. Again, coding it out. But I think since we already understand intuitively the logic that's going on, this code should be a little easier to, to digest and understand. And so if we take this value of query from the output of the prop source attention, we perform distillation, which is convolution, batch normalization, activation, and pooling, we're going to end up with a tensor that is much more compact with less time steps, and hence is more efficient when we are stacking encoder layers. Quiz time. Ooh, this is going to be a fun one. Why use ELU in the informer distillation over RELU? A, ELU is faster than RELU for computation. B, ELU mitigates the vanishing gradient problem. C, ELU introduces nonlinearity in the model while RELU does not. Or D, ELU reduces the shape of the tensor. Comment your answer down below and let's have a discussion. And if you think I do deserve it at this point, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. Now that's gonna do it for quiz time and pass three of this explanation, but before we go, let's generate a summary. The transformer neural network was originally designed to solve sequence to sequence problems. Sequence is data with the defined ordering, like words in a sentence or time series data. And originally it was implemented with language translation in mind. So here the sequence length is small to moderate and this architecture works pretty well. But when the sequences get very large with very long time series data, the architecture has three main issues. The quadratic computation of self-attention, the memory bottleneck in stacking layers for long inputs, and the speed plunge in predicting long outputs. Now, the first issue in the transformer architecture's full attention is because of this operation of multiplying Q cross K, which is going to be order of number of time steps cross number of time steps. So it's order of number of time steps squared. And the informer can basically figure this out and try to avoid this by performing a bunch of operations over here such that the order of operations and multiplications that happen is never quadratic, but instead order of n log n. And in doing so, we are going to get an output tensor, which has a bunch of active queries, as well as a bunch of lazy queries. Now these lazy queries are just occupying space and they can just simply be removed for better computation, faster computation, faster inference in the future. And we do this with the process of distillation. Distillation involves a sequence of operations like convolution, batch normalization, activation, and pooling to reduce the number of time steps and also remove the lazy queries. And that's all we're gonna have for today. The code for this video will be down in the description below, so please do check it out. And if you are interested in just understanding more about the transformer architecture and even seeing me code it from scratch, 
feel free to check out the Transformers from Scratch playlist. Otherwise, if you do think I deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.